Oh, all right. I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, that last One Piece chapter was a runaway freight train of nonsense, right? We had all the stuff with Marco, and then we cut over to Amazon Lily, and, you know, Kobe's there, and Blackbeard's there, and the new updated PX are there, and they're based off of the Warlords, and, like, gene splicing, and mad science, and just a lot of crazy stuff happened, all right? So I think for this chapter, chapter 1060, we dial that back a bit. I think Oda is going to have just a nice, relaxing chapter with the Straw Hats hanging out on the sunny as they travel to their next destination. Nothing crazy going on. Today's chapter review is One Piece chapter 1060 titled Luffy's Dream. Oh, look at that. That's a nice title. That means Luffy's just going to be taking a nap on the, the deck of the sunny and he's going to be having a nice, peaceful dream about, I don't know what Luffy dreams about. <laughs> okay. Actually, Actually, you know what? This is kind of messed up, but I could see Luffy having either one one of two different kinds of dreams, okay? He either dreams about like, you know, like, oh no, there's meat falling from the sky. I gotta grab it all. Oh, oh man, that's good, right? Or maybe he dreams about, because he likes to fight. So maybe he dreams about fighting like a giant meat monster, you know, and then he beats up the meat monster and he eats the meat. Some variation of him, you know, eating in his dreams, okay? So there's kind of like dreams like that that are really fun. And then those are mixed and sprinkled every so often with a severely traumatic, like, PTSD kind of dream where, like, he dreams about holding Ace's dead body in his arms, just like, Ace, no, why? And then he wakes up in a cold sweat, like, ah, Ace, no, you know, that's, yeah, that's kind of messed up, but that probably happens to him every once in a while. Luffy's seen some shit throughout this entire story, all right? So, uh, yeah, but other than that, though, I'm sure it's a very peaceful dream in this one. All right, so uh, we got no cover series this week. We have no continuation of the Germa Double Sixes Emotionless Excursion. What we do get, however, is a very interesting uh, double-page spread with the Straw Hats all sitting on top of a polar bear, I guess. Um, and the polar bear has, like, a piece of tissue paper in its nose, like a bloody nose, so I guess it's implied the Straw Hats beat the crap out of this poor polar bear and then all sat on it to, like, pose for a photo. Polar bears are endangered species, guys. Come on now. Actually, this is an updated version of a uh, cover spread. Not really a cover spread from Volume 8, but way back in the day, and I hope uh, maybe Oda will bring this back. Who knows? Um, but in the Tonko Bonds back in the day, uh, Oda would actually release uh, the coloring corner, which was essentially just like he would draw the line art of like the straw hats in like a particular scene or like in a pose or something, and then you could like color it in, like a little coloring book kind of a situation, right? And so that is a variation of one way back from volume 8. So I kind of wish they would bring that back. A little bunch of like little things like you would find on like the placemat when you go to a family restaurant. Like help Zoro through the maze or something like that. And it's just a straight line. It's just like help Zoro through the maze. Zoro on one end, the treasure's on one end, and it's just a straight path. You know? <laughs> it's like there you go. Um, stuff like that though is, is kind of funny. Alright. So uh, yes, the chapter uh, actually does open up with the Straw Hats traveling on the sunny, just amongst the waves of the New World. Um, there seem to be like giant New World crocodiles like attacking them around the sunny, but they don't really seem concerned about that all too much because they just got the newspaper, alright? And you think that we're being flooded with a lot of information as of late. Can you imagine living in the One Piece world, waking up and reading the newspaper to find out all this crap? Also, doubly for the Straw Hats, they've been in Wano for like the last month or so, I think over a month, honestly, and uh, they have, like, no contact with the outside world, pretty much, so they're finding out all of the stuff we were, like, you know, we, we just found out recently within the last ten chapters or so, they're finding all about out this, like, now, okay? So the first big thing, and Luffy's freaking out about it, he's been let out of the cage, thankfully. Uh, he got let out of the cage for good behavior, I guess, but now they read the paper that uh, Sabo has assassinated King Cobra and Vivi is missing. Now, obviously, the Straw Hats have a very close connection to both of them, as well as Sabo. So Luffy is just like, no, there's no way, you know, this news article is BS. You know, Sabo would have never done that in a million years. He's innocent. And so all the Straw Hats are like, oh yeah, I mean, even Robin brings up just like, yeah, I'm with you there. This doesn't sound like Sabo's MO, murdering the king of a nation, okay? 
Robin mentions that the whole goal of the revolutionaries, and remember Robin, you know, like stayed on Baltigo for two years to train and everything like that. Although, you know, it's funny, that's the one that I'm the most interested in because like, yeah, Usopp running around on the Boeing Islands with Heracles and, you know, that's whatever. Nami training on Wetheria, that's cool. But I really want to find out, like, what did Robin, like, she's got to have access to some information that, like, nobody else knows in the world that, like, Dragon and Sabo, you know, told her, you know what I mean? So anyway, yeah, she mentions, and we've already heard this from Dragon before, the goal of the Revolutionary Army is not to just bring down the entirety of the world government, okay? The goal is to get rid of the Tenryu Obito system, the world nobles, okay? Those are the ones that are causing the problems here, okay? So they're planning to get rid of the world nobles, but not, like, go around and just assassinate kings willy-nilly and stuff like that. If anything, that's the goal of the revolutionaries to, you know, inspire the people to rise up against the cruel, uh, you know, dictators and rulers in the world. You know, like King Seki, the king of the Lulusia kingdom. It's kind of weird that I brought him up. He's like the vampire dude. Whatever. He's not going to be relevant at all. And Wapple as well, same thing. Um, so Robin brings that up. It doesn't really make any sense for, you know, Sabo to assassinate Cobra. So we get a nice little, like, three panels here just to showcase, like, the major uh, headlines that we need to focus on. You know, Sabo declares war on the world nobles by attacking their city and burning down the Celestial Dragon Claw, and then King Cobra assassinated by Sabo, and then Princess Vivi of Alabasta is also missing at the point, okay? So, Luffy, in a stunning display of, like, let's just go do this, um, he's just like, set a course for Alabasta right now! We're gonna figure out what's going on here. And then Zoro's off to the side, and he's just kind of cleaning his sword, and he's just like, Luffy, there's, there's, they're not in Alabasta right now. Zoro, okay, some of the stuff he says here is very reasonable, and some of the other stuff is, is not so much. I think people might give Zoro a lot of flack in this chapter for some of his reasoning, so we'll get to it. But this is actually a good point right there, because Luffy, you know, he, got, he does things on a whim. You know, he doesn't really think about things too much, especially when he's, like, agitated like this. So he reads in the paper that, like, Vivi's missing, Cobra's assassinated, uh, let's go back to Alabasta and, and figure this out. We're going to solve a mystery today, everybody. Zoro's off to the side, and he's like, Luffy, there's nobody in Alabasta right now. The dude's dead. So, you know, they're just taking that at face value. You know, Cobra is dead. Vivi is missing. Um, they're probably not just going to magically turn up in their homeland, okay? So going all the way back to literally the other side of the planet is not really going to do much. Although, it does speak a lot for Luffy that he is willing to put his entire, you know, journey on hold to go and make sure that his friends are okay, okay? So this is something... Actually, it got brought up during Strong World. Remember in the movie Strong World, when they learned that the East Blue was under attack and Luffy almost immediately was like, let's go back to the East, okay? So it's like, yes, he loves his journey and his adventure with his friends and everything to find the One Piece. And they're very, very close to the finish line. But even being so close to the finish line, you know, his friends are more important to Luffy than his own solitary dream or goal. So he's like, hey, you know, if Vivi's in danger, we have to go back to Alabasta. I don't care if we have to backtrack through the whole world and then go all the way back to get where we are right now. We'll do that if it's for a friend, okay? But Zoro does bring up that that doesn't make any sense, so we can't, we're not going back to Alabasta, Luffy. That's just silly. Uh, also, a little bit of a side thing. It's not really directly mentioned by the Straw Hats, um, but yeah, they brought Caribou with them, okay? So Caribou is in the barrel. It's not like he hid on board or anything. It's very clearly like he's all chained up again in the barrel like he was at Fishman Island, okay? So it would make sense this time they decided to bring him with them because they left Caribou on Fishman Island last time and then he broke free and caused a bunch of havoc and started kidnapping mermaids and everything. And then Jinbei had to beat the shit out of him and drag him to the surface. And he ended up on Wano. So the Straw Hats at large are just like, okay, well, we can't just leave Caribou lurking around Wano. He's probably going to, you know, try to, you know, kidnap a bunch of, like, the geishas or, like, tr try to do some weird shit with, like, Hiori or something. So let's just, yeah, let's just chain him up. Let's grab him, throw him in the barrel, you know, lock it up like Frankie did so it's airtight so he can't get out with his Numa Numa Nomi. And I guess we'll just, like, dump him off at, at the first island we land at. It's like, all right, we're on a deserted island with nobody around for a hundred miles. All right, dump him off here. It's just like, oh, come on, guys. You can't leave me here. It's like, yeah, that's great. Have a good night, buddy. See ya. Just sail away. Oh, uh, yeah. Come sail away with me. Caribou just sits on this deserted island with nothing but a coconut tree singing sticks. Oh, God, that's a sad existence. Anyway, so yeah, Caribou's there. So then, 
after Zoro says we can't go to Alabasta, he's like, by the way, all this stuff happened in Marijua. Luffy's like, okay, let's go to Marijua. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, that would have been, oh my God. You know, do a Joseph Joestar there. Oh my God. I would have loved it if they would have carried on with that plot thread, all right? Uh, man, I made a three-part series at the beginning of this year on like what would happen if the Straw Hats did decide to take on Marijua. And there's so much involved with that because it's like it's the center of the world. It's literally them bursting into the castle from the, you know the people that literally control the entire planet essentially like the whole world government. It's a world government for a reason, right? And um, it seems like the Straw Hats are not going to do that, but Luffy did bring it up as a possibility. Like, let's go to Marijua! And Zoro is just like, oh my god. And then Caribou's in the barrel, and he's like, what? We're going to Marijua? Wait, 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 what? You know, what's going on here, okay? And so uh, Zoro brings up also very logical point here. He's like, do you seriously want to bust into the central, like, hub and headquarters for the entirety of the world government and Navy A? HQ. Like, do you seriously want to do that? You, as our captain, is make are, are making that decision for us, right? And so everybody just, um, you know, they're kind of freaking out in their own individual way. Uh, Luffy calls Zoro a chicken. You have Sanji off to the side, bawling his eyes out because Vivi's missing, you know? So they're all, they're all reacting that way. Chopper's crying because Cobra was a really nice person to them. And so, yo, he's like the best king ever, says Usopp. Uh, Nami's there, and Nami's torn between, like, I don't even know how you know to feel bad about like Vivi's whereabouts or how Vivi is feeling about her father being assassinated apparently um, let's see uh, now then we have the straw hats that don't necessarily haven't like met Vivi they haven't been with the straw hats long enough since Vivi was on board but Jinbei just says you know mm, it seems like the reverie was rather tumultuous this year tumultuous. That's a fun word. You don't get to use that very often. Great word choice there, Jinbei. Uh, then you have Frankie, who's like, oh, wait, yeah, Sabo, that's the bro that we met during Dressrosa, because that's the only reference point he knows. Brooke actually says something really interesting. Brooke brings up that, um, I've never known anyone to, uh, be dissatisfied with the way that the Alabasta Kingdom was run, okay? Now, it's interesting because Brooke is 90 years old, so a lot of the stuff that he says is in reference to when he was alive, because, like, Brooke was, like, you know, his first life, you know, he died when he was 38. And then he spent 50 years in the middle of a foggy, you know, part of the ocean that not a lot of people travel into. He got no news, no updates on anything. And then he finally got rescued by the Straw Hats, you know, just two years ago, okay? So most of the information Brooks says is probably really outdated, but also gives us some interesting introspective into the way of the One Piece world, like, 50-plus years ago, okay? Like, remember when they were talking about Roger at Shockey's Bar when they first got to Sabaody, and Brooke was just there eating some rice or something, and he's like, like, hmm, Roger. Yeah, I think there was, like, this rookie named Roger when I was a pirate, but, eh, he's not that big of a deal, I guess. You know, so it's that sort of thing. So it's interesting that Brooke says, like, oh, nobody's ever had any d discontent with the way Alabasta was run. Like, the kings were always very kindly. This is probably referring to, like, Cobra's father or maybe even Cobra's grandfather way back when Brooke was, you know, maybe the leader of that uh, battle convoy in the West Blue. You know, that's, like, the information he remembers. So, yeah, it makes sense. The Nefeltari family has always always been relatively kind compared to some other families in the One Piece world that run the world government, you know? All right. So, um, uh, Nami and Chopper and Luffy, they all start crying like, we're gonna go save Vivi, we're gonna find her. And here's where we get to the point in the chapter where Zoro's logic is a little bit faulty, okay? So Zoro responds to all of them whining about, he says, Hey, Luffy, don't you remember that time when you talked about Ace when he was in trouble? So this is referring to the moment way back in Thriller Bark when after uh, Lola explains to the Straw Hats what Vivera cards are and Luffy has the Vivera card that Ace gave him way back at Alabasta, they look at it and now that they know it's a Vivera card, they notice it's beginning to burn up. 
And then Lola tells them like, oh, that's not good. That means whoever, who gave you this card? Was it somebody important? And Luffy's like, yeah, it was my older brother Ace. You know, he's awesome. He's made a fire. And Lola's like, well, that's not great for him because whenever the Viva card, you know, shrinks, that means he's, his life is in danger. And there was a debate there for a little bit, like, are the Straw Hats going to go find Ace? Are they going to go try to save him or whatever? And Luffy opted not to. He said, in, and we even see a flashback in this chapter here, with it's like, oh, Ace has his own adventures, you know, he'll be fine, you know, if it gets really, really, really bad, then we can go and, and try to save him, but I'm just going to leave him to his own devices. You know, I, he doesn't want his little brother showing up to bail him out of a, of a tough situation. He would never get over that. So Luffy is remembering what he said, and he sort of has a grimace on his face of just like, yeah, I, I mean, I know I, I said that Ace would, but I mean, and then so Zoro goes on to say, you know, you trusted Ace to his own, you know, his own way, his own path, his own adventure, you know, uh, you know, why, un why underestimate Vivi? You know, Vivi is very strong and capable, you know, I I'm sure she will be fine. Okay, Zoro. I get it. I get the logic you're going with here, but let's do a quick tally on why this doesn't, you know, sync up. It's not the same situation between Ace and Vivi, all right? Ace had been a pirate for three years, longer than Luffy even set out to sea to be a pirate. And he had trained for that his entire life. He was very strong even before he ate the Mara Mara no Mi. Then he ate the Mara Mara no Mi, and he trained with it for three years. Go read the Ace Light novel, it's incredible, okay? And so, Ace got a freaking Logia, one of the rarest devil fruits out there, and trained with it constantly, so to the point where he was a really powerful Logia user. He had the power of fire, for God's sake. He he was a Yonko commander under the strongest man on earth, Edward Newgate, Whitebeard. He had a cool boat that he could ride around on and had an awesome name. You know, he was a really strong, he had hockey as well. Ace did have Conqueror's hockey. He just never used it in like the present storyline, but he had it back when he was a kid. There's actually been a lot of debates that because he decided to make Whitebeard the new king of the pirates or the ruler of, you know, everything, that uh, his Conqueror's hockey actually weakened a little bit because he was no longer fighting for himself to be the strongest, but Whitebeard, I don't know, he just never really used it that much in the present storyline, but he does have it. So, yeah, in summary, Ace has an incredibly powerful Devil Fruit, is really strong, you know, he's a pirate, he's a Yonko commander. Vivi is a princess. Now, that's not to say Vivi isn't strong, you know, she was a, a member of Baroque Works, but even in that organization, which, you know, power scaling in One Piece, you know, if, if the Straw Hats, any of the Straw Hats could pretty much take on, like, you know, Mr. Three right now, and he was, like, one of the strongest officers back in the day, right? So, it's like, Vivi was Miss Wednesday. She was a frontier agent. She was an assistant to a frontier agent, right? Now, yeah, she could handle herself in a fight. I'm not saying she couldn't. If it was just some random mountain bandits or some thugs off the street, yeah, Vivi could take them down no problem, but she doesn't know hockey, she doesn't have a devil fruit, she's not a Yonko commander, all right? You know, Ace had a damn Logia, the power of fire, one of the raw elements, the strongest forces of this primal earth at his disposal. Vivi has a glorified keychain and a duck. That's about it, okay? So it's like, yeah, Ace could handle himself. We didn't get involved with his adventures, so we shouldn't get involved with Vivi's either. She's a strong and capable woman. She'll be fine. It's like, okay, I mean, that's great. Zoro has confidence in her, I guess. And remember, Zoro is the first mate of the Straw Hats. His whole thing is to let Luffy do pretty much what he wants for the most part. Like, he's a very emotional character captain, but for the most part, it doesn't matter. It's like, hey, Luffy, do you want to go to that nice peaceful island over there, or do you want to go to the island with the giant dragon and the lightning bolts and the volcano erupting? Luffy would be like, oh, I want to go to that one. He's like, yeah, all right, you got my sword. You know, it's like, whatever. Zoro doesn't care about that. But when it's something like this, where Luffy makes a big decision on a whim, like, let's go back to Alabasta, let's go to Marijua, let's just sail around until we find Vivi. Um, and I understand there's problems with that as well, because they don't know where she is, so they're kind of just like, let's just start sailing around looking for her. Obviously, that's not a great idea. I'm just saying Zoro's logic is kind of faulty here, because, you know, Vivi's situation, very, very different from Ace's. And I'm sure Vivi has been training in the palace the last two years. I'm sure she's gotten stronger than she was during uh, Alabasta and when she
when she was in Baroque works and everything. Maybe she upgraded her peacock slashers a bit. Maybe she can add armament hockey to those things. I don't know, but like, she's not nearly on the level of Ace. And Ace was a pirate adventuring. She's a princess. It's a different kind of situation. Also the fact that they were in Marijois when she apparently went missing. So, you know, if a member of Cypher Pool Zero, like if Rob Lucci, you know, was the one that captured Vivi, there's nothing Vivi could do about that. There's no way. You know, Rob Lucci's way too strong, you know? So, yeah, I'm just gonna bring that up there with Zoro. But I understand his point of, like, we need to, we need to focus on something else. We can't just, you know, sail around looking for her, okay? Um... And so it is funny though, because uh, Chopper, Luffy, and Sanji and Nami all start like making fun of Zoro. So they call him like, you know, you're an Oni, Zoro. No, you're even worse. You're an Oni Gashima. You're like a green Kaido or a green mom, you know, in reference to Big Mom. And, uh, you know, Sanji's there and she's like, you stupid Marimo moss head. And Zoro is still like, yeah, you shut up, number four. I'll take shit from Luffy and Nami and Chopper. I'm not going to take shit from you number four, <laughs> you know, because Sanji, like, ranks the fourth now, okay? Um, let's see here. So, Robin continues reading the newspaper, and she brings up, like, oh my god, all this crazy stuff happened when we're in Wano, like, the news just keeps coming. You know, it's everything that really happened, really, you know, the warlord system was abolished, that means that the government is confident in having a force that contends with the warlords, now the warlords are out there just being regular pirates unleashed onto the world, that's eventually what led the cross guild to get founded. And of course, we can't forget the strongest pirate that ever lived across the seven seas. The brilliant jester, Buggy D. Clown is now an emperor. And then Luffy's just like, that is the one thing that you like. Like Robin's reading off all this news and then she gets to Buggy. And Luffy's like, yeah, they, that's the one thing that doesn't make any sense out of all this. Like one of these things is not like the other, you know. Also funny because Robin has never met Buggy either. You know, Robin, Frankie, Brooke, Jinbei, they've never met met Buggy, never had any interactions with Buggy. So from their perspective, they're just like, man, this, you know, Brooks there strumming his guitar like that brilliant clown. I hope we don't run into him across these evil seas. You know, Frankie's like, man, I better make a, a giant, like, you know, Hulk buster armor suit, but the clown buster, you know, something like that. And Luffy's off to the side. Luffy, Zoro, Nami are off to the side. Like, no, seriously, he's not that big of a deal, really. Uh, actually, Chopper as well. Chopper's never met Buggy either. Um, you know, and Sanji, did Sanji ever meet him? I, did Sanji meet him at Logtown? I can't remember. Are the only Straw Hats that have interacted with Buggy, Luffy, Nami, Zoro? Is that it? That might be actually it, because I remember at Logtown, Usopp and Sanji were with them at Logtown, but they spent a lot of the times down, like, at the docks, and I think Sanji was the one that, like, helped rescue Luffy off the scaffolding, but I don't know if he had a direct interaction with Buggy there. I don't know, somebody's gonna have to go back to the Logtown arc and check, but I think only three of the Straw Hats might have actually had an interaction with Buggy. And then it was just Luffy all throughout Impel Down, it was just Luffy, so, yeah, eh, crazy. Anyway, um, Robin continues, and she's like, hey, Luffy, uh, there's also some, you know, articles about some other big names, like contemporaries, like the other supernovas in the paper. Uh, do you want me to read about them? What, what they're up to? What they're doing these days? And Luffy's just like, nah, it's cool. If something comes up and it's important, to let me know. And Robin's like, yeah, okay, I don't want to overload you with information. With I, I love that, Robin. My god, that's so sweet. She's just like, yeah, it's I understand, Luffy. It's too much information for you. It's okay. I'm gonna go make some tea. You know, because it's like, there's no point. There's no point, like, Luffy, alright, let me give you a debriefing, okay? The situation with Mad Monka Rouge. The, situ the situation with Jewelry Bonnie. The the situation with Diaz Drake. You know, it's like Luffy, the situation with Blackbeard. It's just gonna overwhelm Luffy, and he's already had enough information for the day. So he just lays down on the sunny and just kind of like, you know, puts his hands behind his head, and he's just like, yeah, whatever, I don't care about any of that. I will say, though, Sabo's innocent. It's just he's had a really restrictive upbringing, you know, recalling, you know, when they met at the Goa Kingdom. Sabo is the son of a noble from the Goa Kingdom, uh, Outlook the Third. Um, I often always, uh, misconstrue it that Sabo was the son of the uh, the king of the Goa Kingdom, but that's not actually the case. In fact, we never even really, I think we saw the king of the Goa Kingdom in one panel, but it was only like, he was in bed and we only saw like his like his beard and that was it, okay? So, you know, Outlook the Third was a nobleman and Sabo was his son and then he left, he ran away from home and then they had a uh, Steli that came in as his stepson. Steli grew up as a noble and then married the princess of the Goa Kingdom and now Steli is the king and then 
she is the queen, okay? It's also heavily implied that Steli was the one that murdered the previous king and queen, okay? So that's how that goes. Um, but anyway, yeah, so he's like, oh, he's had a really rough upbringing, and he recalls Sabo, and it's actually really cool because we get Sabo's original dream that we had way back during the Goa Kingdom that I honestly had forgotten about, but Sabo's dream was actually to go out there and adventure and see the world and then write a book about it. That was the whole point, you know? Very similar to Mass Deuce, who was the, uh, the first mate of the uh, Spade Pirates in the Ace Light novel, who just wants to write a book about the world. He's not interested in being a pirate at first, and then Ace asks him to, okay? Uh, so that was Sabo's dream, to write a book about the world, all the crazy adventures people can get into, kind of like Bragman a little bit. Ace's dream is not stated in the chapter, but I believe when he was a kid, his dream was to be a great pirate uh, on his own merit, because he didn't like Roger, he didn't like his biological father. So he was like, you know, I'm going to make my own name for myself. I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm going to be a great pirate under my own weight. Okay, that was his dream. And then we get to Luffy's dream, which was said a few times. Well, it was said once before, um, you know, when Luffy was with Sabo and Ace when they were on the cliff back when they were kids. Luffy's like, yeah, I'm going to be king of the pirates. But that's not his true dream. That's kind of just the impetus for his dream. He has to, it's a prerequisite. He has to become the king of the pirates to make his dream possible. So he says to Sabo and Ace, I'm going to become king of the pirates and then I'm going to dot, 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 and then we cut away. And back during that flashback, we didn't hear what Luffy said. But we did get Sabo and, you know, Ace's reaction to that. And even as kids, they were like, that's so childish. That's ridiculous. That's never going to happen, Luffy. What's wrong with you? And Luffy's like, ha, ah, she, 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 you know? Now, we also got this during Roger's flashback, or Odin's flashback about Roger, when Odin and Whitebeard were sitting around talking to Roger about the Poneglyphs and what his goal is and everything, Roger was a little bit more serious about it, but it's implied it was the same exact dream, okay? So Roger's there, and he's like, yes, uh, your guy be Goldie Roger, King of the Pirates, Whitebeard, would you lend me Odin for just a single year? I can, a single yar. <laughs> I, can, I can find the last road Poneglyph, he can decipher him, and we can find laugh tale. Then, at long last, I can become king of the pirates, matey, and then I can dot, 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 and then we just, once again, we don't hear what Roger said, but it's implied the same thing Luffy said, and then we cut to Whitebeard and Odin's reaction of, like, Odin's reaction being, like, <gasps> like, stunned, because it's probably something similar relating to the Joy Boy lore, and then Whitebeard is just like, ah, Roger, how old are you? Come on, really? That's the kind of dream you want? So, here right now, Luffy, as he's resting on the Thousand Sunny, says to everybody that, uh, what his dream is. And once again, we don't get to hear what it is. However, however, and this is very, very important. If there's one thing to take away from this chapter, pay attention to the Straw Hats reactions. I'm telling you what right now, each of the individual Straw Hat reactions is going to play a massive role in what Luffy's dream is, and this is going to be referenced again, so I'm serious. Take notes right now. I mean it. Go and grab a notepad or open up a notepad on your computer or an app on your phone. I'm serious. Do it right now, okay? Go grab a pencil, a pen, I don't care, whatever writing implement you have. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Go and grab it. This is important shit. Why do you think I'm here? Do you think I'm here just to be like, hey, everybody, how you doing? Luffy punched somebody. All right, bye. <laughs> no, no, this is important, okay? We're getting into the final saga of One Piece. There will be a test. You got to take some notes, okay? All right. So, Luffy sits on the sunny. He says everybody to what his dream is, and then we get their reactions, okay? So the first reaction we get is honestly the Sonny, because we get a, a scene from the Sonny's figurehead, and the Sonny just has the question mark over it. I'm pretty sure that's just the collectiveness of the Straw Hats being like, what? Okay, but maybe that is the Sonny's reaction. I don't know, make a note of that. That might be relevant even, I don't know. All right, the first reaction we get is Zoro. Zoro has like a bead of sweat kind of coming down his face, and he's just like, huh? Then we have Jinbei's. Jinbei's is more stunned, and he's just kind of like, what? what did you say, Luffy? Then we have Nami's. Nami's is like, what? Then we have Brooks. Brook is elated. He is like tearing up from laughing so much. He's like, no! 
Oh, you're too much, Luffy. <laughs> then we get Usopp, who's a little bit more serious, but he's like, are, are you serious, Luffy? Really? Then we get Frankie's, who's also similar to Brooke, busting out laughing. <laughs> oh, that's super. Oh, that's great, Luffy. Oh, my. Then we have Sanji, who is laughing, and Sanji's like, <laughs> Chopper, can you check his head to make sure that he's okay? Maybe give him some medicine. We have Robin, who doesn't say anything. She's just like, <gasps> then we have Chopper, who is also elated. He's like, wow, that's crazy, Luffy, my god, all right? Uh... I'm going to follow up on that in a second, okay? But there's one more. This is an awesome double-page spread, by the way, where Luffy's just on the deck, and he's like, anyway, that's what my dream's going to be. And it just he looks so peaceful and happy, and just like, I think he's going to be able to do it, whatever his dream is. Uh, Usopp is there, and he's just like, um, Luffy, uh, I mean, it, it falls in line with you, but uh, is there any way, like, anyone could ever do that? And Luffy's on the deck, and he's like, well, I think I'll have a shot if I can become King of the Pirates first. And just like, well, knowing you, I should have figured it was something like this. And then that's when Luffy gets up and is like, wait a second, have I never told you what my dream is? You guys have been traveling with me for two years? Literally, you made me your, your, your captain, and you, I never told you guys anything about why we're actually doing this? Which is great, because, like, they're a family, so it doesn't really matter, you know? It's like some vague, like, let's just travel together, have adventures, and become King of the Pirates. Why not? So it's like, no, Luffy, you've never said this to us before. And Luffy's like, oh, okay. I guess the only people I've told then were Sabo and Ace when I was a kid, and then Shanks as well. And I guess that was it. And so they, they ask, uh, Robin just kind of like, she's like, oh, and how did they react? And he's like, oh, Ace and Sabo, they laughed, and then, oh, Shanks laughed so damn hard, you know, there was tears rolling down his face. So we get, we already had Ace and Sabo's reaction, but I don't think we ever saw Ace, uh, Shanks' reaction to this. So we got Shanks' reaction was very similar to Brooke and also uh, Frankie's reaction of, like, the tears rolling down their face. Like, ah, oh, Luffy, you crazy kid, you. You know, okay. So, um, yeah, Jinbei begins to cry, and he's like, well, I guess I joined this crew willingly. I guess I should accept that, you know, your dream is also, I guess that's what I have to shoulder now. That's what you want, Captain? All right, we'll make it happen, right? And this is when all the strides, like, the, the ones that were a little stunned by what Luffy said, they're beginning to come around to it a little more. And it's a great scene. It's a great scene where uh, Chopper is now, tears are now strolling down his face, and he has the big eyes. Like, Luffy, the more I think about it, it's just insane. It's crazy. I'll help you any way I can. And Nami just starts crying as well. I actually love the scene with Nami where, I don't know, she looks at Luffy sort of like, sort of like a, like, like a dorky little brother but she like really loves and it's just like, you know, Luffy, that's the most ridiculous dream ever. I wish you the best. I'll help you every way I can. You know, that kind of thing, right? It's a very, it's a very heartwarming, wholesome scene. It really is, okay? Oh my god, this is beautiful. Now, um, I think we're moving on to the next, yeah, we're moving on to the next scene. So let's, let's dissect this, okay? The Straw Hat's reactions to this, okay? I believe, and th there's a general theory out there what Luffy's dream is, and it's some variation, I'm not exactly sure the way Luffy worded it with the Straw Hats, but it's some variation of, <clears throat> I want to have a giant party with everybody all over the world. You know, basically some variation of that. Like, I'm going to become king of the pirates, and then I'm just going to throw a massive party, and everyone in the entire world is invited, okay? So just keep that in mind. That might not be what it is, but that's what I think it is. That's what a lot of people think it is right now. I mean, you could always go with something even more ridiculous, like, okay, I'm going to become king of the pirates, and then we're going to blast off into space, you know? But I, I, like the, um, I like the big party idea, okay? And the thing is... It does sound childish. It sounds really childish. I mean, imagine if anybody in this world today that we live in had that dream. You know, like, let's say, you know, some ruler of a nation stepped up to the podium and is like, my dream is to have a party where everybody in the world is invited. 
I mean, that's a very nice, idyllic dream, but you'd probably be laughed off stage, okay? Like, that's probably... And it's and it's no different in the One Piece world, okay? Think of all the political strife and all the differences and all the, the oppression and everything. Like, slavery exists in this world, for God's sake, right? And so with all of that together, Luffy just stating, like... I want to throw a party and everybody's invited. We can all hang out and just have an awesome time and eat some meat and have some drinks and eat some candy and just everybody's invited. You can see how people would react to that. And if Roger said the same thing, you can see why white people react to that. You can say the reactions to that, the reactions to that, you can actually almost do a test with this. You could do a test with this. Go up to somebody that you know, like a friend or a family member, somebody that doesn't read One Piece or has no idea about One Piece at all, and just say to them, like, go up to somebody and just be like, hey, you know, I, uh, can I talk to you for a moment? And they're like, about what? And I'm just like, um, you know, I have this, I have this, like, dream. I want the world, like, like an ultimate dream for the world, you know? And I just want, I just want to tell you my dream. They're like, okay, what? And just be like, I want the whole world to get along and just come together in a massive party and we can just forget our worries and we can just have fun. That person's reaction would probably be something similar to the Straw Hats. Either it would be like Zoro or Nami's reaction, which is just like, what? Or it would be a reaction kind of like Robin's, which is just like stunned sort of silence. Or it would be a reaction like Usopp's, like, are you serious? Really? That's, okay, well, that's never going to happen, you know, something like that. Or it might be a reaction like Frankie or Sanji's or Brooks, where it's just like, <laughs> all right, yeah, I mean, like, that would be pretty, pretty badass if that ever happened, okay. It would probably be something similar, you know what I mean? So, the ones that I want to point out here. The Straw Hats, I want to point out Chopper's first, actually, because Chopper is the youngest member of the Straw Hats, and he sort of has the angle of, like, the childlike wonderment of it, you know? So, if, you know, that is Luffy's dream, I want to throw a party for everybody, Chopper would be the first person that would be like, Oh my god, that sounds like so much fun, Luffy! Yeah! Let's throw a party! Yeah! You know, like, that would be Chopper's reaction, so look, pay attention to Chopper's reaction. I like to also focus on Jinbei and Nami's reactions. Theirs are very important as well, because Jinbei is a fish man, and he understands all of the prejudice and all of the strife that the fishmen and the merfolk have had with the humans for centuries at this point. Literally, it was mentioned before that 200 years ago, fishmen and merfolk were not even given basic rights like humans were. They were basically classified as animals, fish, and then that was it, okay? And then Nami, was like under the rule of Arlong for a good chunk of her childhood. You know, Arlong killed Belmere and everything, and so she had to live with that horrible oppression for most of her life, you know, and everything. So when Luffy says something like, everybody, all the people of the world are gonna come together and have a giant party and it's gonna be fun, Jinbei and Nami are the ones that are like, oh, I can think of a few problems with that. Um, it's a good dream. It's just, they're the ones that I think are the ones that are the most aware of the current situation of everything and how impossible that dream is, but also at the same time how pure of hearted Luffy is for having it. This is not a joke on Luffy's part. This is not some this is not something that he made on a whim. This is not something. No, this is a genuine dream he has had ever since he was a kid, and he held on to that. Okay, he never let it go. He never grew out of it and thought that like, oh, that's a childish dream. I'm gonna move on from that. Something more realistic. No, no. That's what he wanted to have this big party, assumingly, ever since he was a little kid, and he still wants that now, okay? So Jinbei and Nami's reactions are, are very important. Robin's is also very important because she knows how cruel the world can be as well. Like her homeland was buster called into oblivion. Uh, it makes sense that Brooke and Frankie also had a reaction like they did because, you know, Frankie a little bit more with like, he's like, oh yeah, you know, because maybe Frankie's a little bit more immature than the rest of the Straw Hats, and Brooke just, you know, he's a freaking rock and roll skeleton, so it's like, have a party with everybody involved, oh yeah, that sounds radical, Luffy, you know, like, that makes sense there. Usopp is kind of just stunned, like, are you serious? Like, is this a lie? Is this going to be a real thing? Sanji's laughing, because I think, I think Sanji, after everything that happened at Totland especially, like, Sanji's just going to go with Luffy on whatever, and he's like, yep, you're our captain, pretty 
much, right? So, yeah, like I said, that that's just me going along with this based off of the theory that that's what Luffy's dream is, okay? It could be something completely different, or it could be something similar to the party aspect, just worded in a different way. So just keep all that in mind and take it with a grain of salt. But I'm serious, take notes, pay attention to the Straw Hats' reactions, they are going to be relevant, okay? Just like how Roger's reaction to the One Piece was relevant. Like, he laughed. I'm like, very important, okay? So, it was also revealed that Shanks' reaction was he laughed as well. So definitely going to do a follow-up on this, but just pay attention to that. Okay. So very wholesome moment. Very nice. Um, so now we have a scene where, um, you know, I guess we have to make you the king of the pirates as quick as possible then, right? Okay, so Frankie's like, off to Laugh Tale! Oh, full steam ahead! The Sunny will take you to Laugh Tale! And then Robin is like, ah, I think you're speaking a little bit too quickly there, Frankie. A little bit too hastily. I know you're excited, but, uh... We don't even know where Raftail is. Uh, Laugh-tail, la Raftail, I'm like switching back and forth between the way it used to be said. We don't know where Laugh-tail is. We need the last road poneglyph or load poneglyph now. And Robin says, it has not been seen in a very, very long time. We have no idea where to even begin to look, okay? And so that is uh, where we have a cutaway from that part of the chapter. And now we uh, cut over to the second portion of the chapter over at uh, Marine HQ, which is formerly G1. So this is located in the New World. Um, get ready for this, ladies and gentlemen. This is this is going to move fast, okay? Got to go fast. Here we go. All right. So we this is continuing the conversation with the revolutionaries. So Sabo gets in touch with Koala and Dragon. We don't know where he was at. He begins the uh, the conversation over the Den Den Mushi. The Marines at HQ are scrambling with the surveillance network because they were wiretapping them. So we have Marines running around all over the place like, Sir! Sir! We have an intercepted call from the Kamabaka Queendom from Sabo! It's like, okay, we have to patch it through. He's not using a white Den Den Mushi. I am so glad that they brought that up. I brought that up last time. The white Den Den Mushis are a, a very rare breed of Den Den Mushi that are able to jam wiretapping. And we've seen that the Revolutionary Army has one, so I was curious into why they weren't using one with this call from Sabo, okay? So a couple of things. Number one, it seems to imply that the person making the call has to be the one using the white Den Den Mushi, okay? It doesn't work if it's the person receiving the call because they can still intercept where the call is coming from, okay? And also it implies that the white Den Den Mushi slows the communication down a bit. Sort of like if you attach a white Den Den, Den, Den Mushi to the call, maybe it takes a longer time for the call to connect and Sabo is in such a hurry he has to just get the message across so he's just like I gotta call dragon dragon uh crazy news okay I gotta go bye click you know that's he doesn't have time to set up the white Den, Den Mushi he might not even have one we have no idea where he's at right now so that's that's the explanation on why they didn't use the white Den, Den Mushi I'm so glad Oda put that in it's just a little little piece of world lore that not a lot of people probably even remember but I, I appreciate it I really do so um, we now cut to the Gorose in their room of authority, and they're overhearing the conversation. So the Marines at HQ are wiretapping Sabo and Dragon's conversation. And that feed is being sent to a Den Den Mushi in the room of authority at Marijua. So the Gorose are there sitting on their couches, pacing around, and they're listening to the wiretapping division's, you know, intercepted call. Okay, so just pay attention to that. That will be very important, okay? So, the, uh, the Marines trace the call, and it's coming from the Lelusia Kingdom. Hey, the Lelusia Kingdom! That did come around to being relevant, who knows? Okay, so the Lelusia Kingdom is a kingdom. We actually find out in this chapter it's located in the New World. That actually creates some other problems, but that's like nitpicking stuff. Not really. I think we'll cover it when we cover it. But the Lelusia Kingdom is in the New World. It's the place where the Revolutionary Army, we first met the commanders, like Bello Betty and Morley and Lindbergh and Karasu. They showed up to defeat Peachbeard. Moda was there. Bello Betty used her powers to like rile up the, the populace and fight back against Peachbeard. Uh, King Seki, who's the vampire dude. Uh, also Komain, who was the princess. Remember the princess? princess that got kidnapped on the way to Reverie in the submarine by the bandits, and then Kobe is the one that, like, rescued her, that's King Seki's daughter. That's Princess Komain, okay? So they are the rulers of the Lelusia kingdom, and it was mentioned many times that Lelusia does have a lot of problems. King Seki is a really shitty ruler. He's kind of a despot, you know, in the same vein as, like, Wapple, okay? So that's, that's important. But anyway, it is one of the eight kingdoms that makes sense that rebelled. So we heard about this with the Revolutionary Army getting all riled up and everything, and so 
Sabo being the Flame Emperor, that Lelucia was one of those eight kingdoms that rose up and fought against their, um, their, their nobility, against the kings, and overthrew them, okay? So that is actually where Sabo is hiding out, which makes sense. It's a friendly kingdom that, like, basically looks at him as essentially a god or a savior, so it would make sense that he's hanging out there. So the Gorosei get wind of this, and they're like, he's hiding in the Lelucia kingdom. Seriously? Hmm. That's, um, wow. <laughs> and one of the other ones, the one with the, the younger one of the Gorosei, I always call him Sanji's uncle, the one that's blonde, he's just like, man, that is a really unlucky man. <laughs> and then the, the one that has the, uh, the mark, like Gorbachev's mark, he's just like, mm, no, this is fate. Um, so we now cut to the phone call between Sabo and Dragon, and it gets a little confusing with all the different speech bubbles. There's speech bubbles that are their conversation, but it's also like the conversations that they're having at Kamabaka at the same time. It's kind of hard to explain. But basically, Sabo is like, Dragon san, come in, Dragon. And then Dragon's like, yes, Sabo, what's up? I have to tell you, I'm not the one that killed Cobra. And then all of the revolutionaries applaud. You know, Morley has tears streaming down her face. Ivankov's there, like, yeehaw, I knew you didn't do it, Sabo. I knew you wouldn't have killed him. Inazuma's there striking an epic pose. I love Inazuma's poses. They're so cool. So that was one of the first things that Sabo had to say. He's like, listen up, Dragon. I did not kill Cobra. I, I can't explain the whole details right now, but I have to just say that. Okay, I did not kill Cobra. Also, by the way, we see Sabo the first time in forever. He has bandages and stuff all over his face, but he doesn't look like seriously wounded or anything. But then he goes on and he's like, but Dragon, I saw something else in Marie's watch. Something unbelievable. Something unconceivable. Something unbelievable. Unbelievable! I already said that. Listen, I have to tell you how crazy and unbelievable it was. Well, out with it, man. What is it? It's just really unbelievable. <laughs> it's just like he takes a little while to actually get to the point. But, um, so while this is going on, we cover to the Lelucia kingdom and we see that King Seki and Komain are both locked up in a, a prison cell. Okay, and they're chained up and King Seki's like, you fools, after all I did for you as king, wait until Navy HQ gets a word of this. They'll come and wipe you all off the face of the earth. I'm a vampire. <sighs> And then Komain is there, and Komain's like, yeah, you tell him, Dad. You know, and also leave some for me after I get out of here. Komain, remember, was the was the princess that after she was rescued from her kidnappers, she just, like, like be, proceeded to, like, beat the shit out of them afterwards, which was fair. She was being kidnapped, but she has a kind of a, a brutal side to her as well, right? And so it's so kind of an interesting, like, juxtaposition of this, where King Seki's like, you fools think you can overthrow me? And then it cuts to the guards, like, the, the people of the island, the citizens that rose up and, like, you know, overthrew their king and, like, threw him into the prison cell, they're pretty chill about everything. They just, they're holding, like, a spear or whatever. This is Mogura, but it's just like, he's just like, King Seki, I, I, I mean, Lord, whatever, like, all you have to do is confess your crimes, you know, we're not gonna execute you, we're not brutal, you know, we're not gonna kill you, King Seki. We just want you to admit that you were mistreating us, and then, you know, just piss off forever and let us elect our new ruler, I guess. I don't know. But they're pretty chill for, like, revolutionaries. Like, REVOLUTION! STORM THE CASTLE! You know what I mean? Like, considering that's what happened, like, they threw the king in freaking jail or whatever, they're like, he's like, you know, your majesty, please, there's no reason to shout, you know? So, whatever. Anyway, we now cut over to Eam. Yeah, no shit. We cut over to Eam in Castle Pangea, and Eam just silently approaches a map on a table. He doesn't say anything. We still don't know anything more about Eam. Eam takes out, I guess, a, a paintbrush. I think that, see, this is why the scene's a little confusing. I'm not really sure if this is Eam doing this or if it's the Gorosei doing this. But somebody at some location takes a map of the New World. We see Lelucia marked on the map, and then just takes a paintbrush, and then just... X's out Lelucia. And this is intercut with Sabo continuing his conversation like, it happened in the throne room at Pangea Castle. It's absolutely insane. There was somebody sitting on the, uh, not the Iron Throne, there was somebody sitting on the empty. And then as this is happening, the Gorosei are giving an order to the Marines, cut the signal from the surveillance division so that the surveillance division cannot overhear what Sabo's about to say because Sabo witnessed Eam. 
Sabo saw Eam sitting on the empty throne. That is like the biggest like state secret that you could possibly have in the world government, in the One Piece world. That is the one piece of information. You find out about Eam, you are dead. And we see in this chapter the lengths that the world government, and probably Eam specifically, is willing to go to, you know, make sure no one knows about their existence, okay? So we assume the feed is cut so that the Marines are no longer intercepting the call. And then Sabo continues and he says, you know, the empty throne I saw wasn't empty. I saw... And then we cut to like, I don't know, an announcement at Marie Joie? to the Marines, from the Gorosei, whatever. It's like some sort of announcement, and it's... As far as the Surveillance Division is concerned, no call was intercepted today. No information was gained. There was no call intercepted whatsoever. As for the Lelusia Kingdom, that country never existed at all. And then while that is playing over, we see, I, in the anime, I want Difficult to play over this. Difficult is the One Piece uh, soundtrack. It's the one that plays when uh, Kuma is about to do the Urasasa shock back at Thriller Bark, like, da 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 you know, that one, you know? And so, that, I, that needs to play over this. The skies over the Lelusia Kingdom begin to just become really dark and foreboding. And all the citizens are, like, looking up at the sky, like, is it raining? What is that? No. That's not rain. There's something up there. What's in the sky? And then everybody looks up, all the citizens, King Seki and Komain look up from their prison cell. Dogs are barking in the streets. Sabo, wherever he is, stops his call and looks up at this light. And then you just see this just hailstorm of laser beams raining down from the clouds above striking Lelusia and just annihilating it off the damn map. Like a giant explosion, like a nuclear bomb blast. Just boom! Flash of light and then you're dead, okay? That is it. Uh, I guess I can count the laser beams if that's relevant. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 laser beams. That's a lot of laser beams, and they're giant laser beams, and they all come together, and they hit the island, and there's just this giant just bubble of an explosion, and then you see the entire island, the castle, the, the towns just crumbling apart. You see Moda there approaching her dad. Moda is like, because uh, Ace has been to this location before. This was part of Ace's great Blackbeard search where he met Moda, the farm girl with the, the milk and everything, the cow, and he's like, you know, give the milk to the Marines. It's like, okay, you know, so she's there as well. We also saw her when when Bello, Betty, and everybody arrived, they saved her. So Moda is there, like, crying, and she's like, Dad, is everything gonna be okay? And then you just... <sighs> okay, so before we... Ca and we immediately... Oh, and after this, it's just like... <sighs> you know, reports of uh, some sea quakes are in the southeastern sea. Please be advised. <sighs> End of transmission. I'm not really sure what that transmission is. I'm not sure if that was, like the Gorosei, or like some other division of the Marines or something, like I'm not really sure who was speaking there, but it was something official. It was something like, you know, like I imagine the Marines are in the surveillance division and they're overhearing the call with Sabo, and these are just ordinary Marines. These aren't like super high-ranking Marines like admirals or anything. These are just regular Marines working in the wiretapping division, and they're like, oh my god, Sabo and Dragon, oh my god, there's something going on. Wait, Sabo did not kill Cobra? What's this all about? Wait a second. Sabo, what did he see at Marijua? And then the Goro say, cut their feed, and just, it's like, ah, what? C captain, we can't, what? The feed cut, we, we have to hear what happened. And the captain is like, nope, the Goro say, cut our feed, son. But we were about to figure out something crazy about the world. The Goro say, cut our feed, son. Well, what does that mean? It means the wiretapping division. He gets on a loudspeaker. It's like every, there's chaos in the wiretapping room. We have to reestablish a connection. He's like, attention all Marines. The wiretapping division intercepted no calls today. Like, what, what is that? The wiretapping division intercepted no calls today. 
Oh, we didn't intercept any calls today, guys. All right, break time. Hey, I think I hear it's Mike's birthday. All right, let's go make him a cake. And it's just like... <laughs> You know there's one Marine that just started on the on the wiretapping division and he's just hanging out there like, what? That doesn't mean his friend is like, I'll tell you later. Come on, let's go have some cake, buddy. Okay, so first of all, did we just see the ancient weapon Uranos? Like that, I mean, what else could it be? It's a giant freaking laser hailstorm from the sky. Uranos is the god of the sky, Pluton is the god of death, and Poseidon is the god of the seas and the oceans and stuff. So, yeah, I would imagine Uranos is a sky-based weapon. We've heard nothing about Uranos other than its name. So this is probably Uranos. This is probably the ancient weapon. Eam has it at their disposal, and this is what they use to exterminate or purge islands off the face of the map, okay? So, also, how does this work with, like, erasing La Lucia from history? Like, they're just scratching it off the map and they're not mentioning it anymore? Um, think about it this way. The world government controls everything from, like, the way that everybody is raised, like, the schooling and everyone. And also, kingdoms in the One Piece world are, for the most part, relatively isolated. Like, if you live in the kingdom, obviously, you'll have a lot of dealings with that kingdom. But if you're on another island, it might be, especially in the Grand Line, it'll be especially difficult to reach one island to the other. There are exceptions like with the sea train and everything like that but for the most part traveling from one island to another in the grand line that is a big deal okay so the lelucia kingdom gets wiped out and the government makes a public order and starts removing it from the textbooks and whatever it's like we don't talk about the lelucia kingdom anymore this is not the first time the government has done this. This is not the first time they've used Uranos to annihilate an island off the face of the map. Oh gee, I wonder if God Valley has any relevance here. Probably, yeah, it's the same exact thing. God Valley was annihilated and Lelucia was annihilated probably in the exact same way. So that happened. Um, oh, by the way, something else. I don't even know if this is going to be a tieback, but I just wanted to bring it up here. Um, a giant floating object in the sky... Remember when um, the supernovas first went into the New World and we saw like a poo like running on the air and Drake went to Kaido's Island? We also saw Beiji sailing in the New World and this giant meteor type thing like lifted him off of the sea and into the sky. And that giant meteor thing had these like giant like vents, almost like it was an object that could fire lasers out of those giant vents. And it had, like, its own gravitational pull or some shit. Like a planet or something. I don't know. Maybe did, did Beiji get, have a run-in with Uranos and manage to escape? That honestly, I'm, I'm not even shitting you. That might be a thing. That might be a thing. Because imagine this. What if, what if back then, uh, Eam was, like, moving Uranos around the New World to annihilate a new island? And what if it does have its own gravitational pull because it's such a big thing, right? So, you know, Beiji just happened to be sailing underneath it. And then his ship got lifted up, and Eam didn't notice. He didn't notice the ship getting taken up or anything. And then what if the fire tank pirates just figured out some way to, like, get the ship off or whatever? It's like, we have to figure out a way to push it off. And then they did, and then it fell back into the ocean, and then it just proceeded to just, like, just fly away without even noticing them. And then the fire tank pirates were just like, what the hell just ca happened, Captain? And then Beiji's like, I have no idea. Oh, well, it's gone now. You know, it's just like, it's not like Eam noticed them or anything, or they got away from the world governments like they didn't even notice. So that's maybe, maybe that's the same thing, honestly. Damn, that means Oda teased us with one of the ancient weapons, like, as soon as, like, right before the time skip happened. That's a very Oda thing to do. Okay, so, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm gonna go with that. Honestly, right now, I'm going with this thing being the ancient weapon Uranos. If anybody else wants to say anything else, what it could have been, fine, but I'm going with that right now, okay? So, uh, yeah. So, obviously I have to, you know, this is like a full video discussion on what the hell just happened. But yeah, um, nobody's going to ask any questions about this. And anybody that does ask any questions about it is probably going to be removed and re-educated and give it a few years and nobody will even mention the Lelousia Kingdom again. This has happened before with plenty of other islands, I am sure, okay? Um, to the point where even the Marines are kind of like, there's probably like protocol for this. Like the Gorosei said it doesn't exist anymore, man. Let it go. I'm like, okay, I guess let it go. So we just, we just pretend that islands don't exist. Welcome to the Marines, Mike. It is just happy birthday. Like, okay. So anyway, there's that, uh, more on that later. 
So now we cut to the last panel, not the last panel, but the last scene of the chapter. The Straw Hats are now, this is a few days later. This is a few days later after this event where all of the island is wiped out. By the way, Sabo might be dead. Probably not because, wait, did we have another Sabo fake out death? God, this keeps happening. This is like the fourth time in this story this has happened. Um, Sabo's, wait, Sabo's a Logia. Does that make him resistance to lasers? I mean, maybe? <laughs> He's like, okay, could Sabo get it? Oh, by the way, Vegapunk might be adapting laser technology. Well, no, that was adapted from the Pika Pika Nomi, but still, you know, the lasers from this thing, whatever it is. I mean, it has to be an ancient weapon. If it's not an ancient weapon, what the hell else is it? I guess you could say it's something that Vegapunk created to try to copy the ancient weapons. Oh, that might be something, but I don't know. This looks like an ancient weapon to me that can annihilate entire islands in one shot, just like how Pluton was said to do that. I think I'm pretty sure this is one of the ancient weapons. I think we just saw one, okay? Not really. We didn't see what it looked like, but maybe. I don't know. Anyway, Straw Hats, a few days later, are sailing in this extremely rough sea. It's also very windy and very cold. And, you know, Jinbei is the helmsman now. He's full-duty helmsman. He's like, ah, you need to furl the sails! It's too windy! Oh, this rain is so choppy! Nami, where's the next island? Uh, and she, Nami's, it's actually really cute. She shows up wearing this full parka, like, it's like, it's so damn cold out here. Yeah, I guess the next island's a winter island. I guess it's gonna be here pretty soon. It's like, alright, hoist the mizzen mast! I'm the helmsman of the Straw Hat Pirates. Da -da 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 -da. You know, it's like, okay. So then we have Chopper, who's like walking outside of the, he's like inside, he's walking outside onto the deck. He has a big uh, straw hat on him, like a big casa hat that Tama made for him. And he's wearing like uh, clothing and he's, he's, you know, he's a reindeer. So the winter climate is perfect for him. So he's like, yeah, I'm going to go outside. I got this hat. I won't get any snow on me. And then Robin is like, oh, don't you look dashing, Chopper. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to go play outside. Okay, hold off on that for a moment. And then Luffy and Nami notice this giant, it's called uh, an eddy, uh, and they say it's like it's like a giant warm eddy in the middle of the ocean. I'm just going to draw it because I. it's like a lollipop that came out of the ocean, or as Brooke says, it's like an afro, okay? So the Sunny is sailing on the ocean, and then all of a sudden this thing is in front of them. It's like a giant ocean current that's coming out of the water, and then it swells into a giant ball, like a giant orb that's just so swirling with waves, okay? It's like a three-dimensional current, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, they see that thing in front of them, and then they're all like, oh man, we can't, you know, we can't get close to that thing or we're gonna get sucked in and get trapped. And like, you know, Jinbei's like, oh, evasive maneuvers! But then Luffy's like, wait a second, I think somebody's trapped in that giant swirling lollipop afro thing. And then Sanji also perks up with his observation hockey and he's just like, yes, I sense a woman's call for distress. And then, you know, they're all looking at Sanji like, really? That You could just tell that, you know, okay. And so they're like, we need to rescue her. And it's like, we can't even get close to that thing. We're gonna get sucked into it. And then Zoro is like, eh, whatever. Hold on. I'll cut it. You know, so he takes out his sword. I love that. Zoro's answer to everything is like, oh, you guys are complaining. All right, just shut up. I guess I'll just cut it and call it a day. And then they're like, you know, you better not harm a single hair off of her head. And he's like, ah, I got it. One sword style. What's it called? Uh, bird dance, I think. Yeah. It's like one sword style bird dance. And he just slices the damn current like in half like that. At the same time that happens, Chopper walks outside and he's like, hey guys, what's all the commotion? Chopper has this giant hat on his head that's way too big for him and a giant like gust of wind just sends him flying off of the side of the sunny. It's so funny, like, Chopper, why did you come outside? And Luffy's like, it's okay, I got him. So Luffy grabs him and then he also gets sent flying because Chopper has like a giant sail like attached to his head. So he just gets sent flying off of the side of the sunny. That's not good, they both have devil fruit powers. So they get sent flying off. At the same time they're flying off, the woman that was trapped inside of the current, um, you know, breaks free. And she just like breaks free and she's like coughing, you know, you know, gasping for air or whatever. And then we see uh, the reaction from the crew of like, oh, it's like a little kid. And then the last shot of the chapter is, we see the person trapped by the current was... Captain of the Bonnie Pirates, the glutton, Jory Bonnie, with a bounty of 320 million. End of chapter, no break next week. Okay, I am, okay. So we're finally going to address Jory Bonnie's character. 
Good. Oh my god. There is so much stuff with her. Like, she's apparently the queen dowager of this kingdom in the south. She has a connection with Kuma. She was in Marijua, you know, which by the way, that was something that was said by Zoro earlier. Like, you know, if things, if, if, if fate happens to cross our paths with something relating to Vivi, then sure. Um, but uh, if not, don't worry about it. Well, I think your paths just got crossed right there because Bonnie was at Marijua. She probably knows where Vivi is right now. If anything, she'll have some information to tell the Straw Hats about her whereabouts, about what actually happened at Marijua. So, how did she end up all the way out here in the New World? No idea. How did she get trapped in a current? I guess she was on a boat and it capsized in the choppy water. They are approaching a winter island. Keep that in mind. So that's gonna, I guess it's not Sphinx after all. I guess the next island they're gonna arrive to isn't Sphinx. Probably isn't also Hachinosu, because Hachinosu is not a winter island. There was a wintry climate around Elbaf. Remember when Big Mom got dropped off at Elbaf when she was a kid, there was like snow and shit, so I, I guess it could be Elbaf, whatever. Um, but anyway, yeah, so Bonnie is here. I'm assuming Luffy and Chopper are gonna rescue her because they're flying off as well. Luffy's probably gonna grab Bonnie and then maybe like, like Chopper, angle your sail back to the ship. Just May, honestly, it could be as simple as the wind just changes directions. So they're flying off of the ship and then the wind changes direction, like they grab Bonnie and just like, and then they just go back to the ship, and then at that point, you know, Sanji could just skywalk up and, like, grab them or something, and then they could, you know, take care of her and, like, tend to her injuries or whatever, and then she can explain to them all the stuff that happened. Um, we're probably going to get uh, an explanation on what her devil fruit power is. We know her ability is that she can manipulate the, uh, her own age as well as the ages of people around her, so it is a time-based devil fruit, but not in the same way that, uh, Toki's was, okay? Um, wait a second. No. That doesn't make any sense. Could Bonnie have the time time fruit? We know that one of the abilities of the time time fruit is to send somebody into the future. Toki never really used it in any other way. But what if there is another way of using it? And I guess also there would be an awakened way of using it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's the same fruit. I don't think. It's just that was one of the last questions from Wano. Like, Toki's dead. What happened to her fruit? You know, that was something. I don't think it's the same fruit. I think it's something different. It, it hasn't operated at all similar to the Toki Toki no Mi, other than the fact it affects time in some way. And there are multiple fruits that can affect things in different ways. You know, like, so Toki's affects physical passage of time, like sending people into the future. Uh, Shinobu's ability matures things and can age people up, but not back. Bonnie's ability is both. So we've seen her as a kid, we've seen her as an adult, and we've seen her as like an old grandma, okay? Um, she can also use this ability on other people as well. You know what I mean? Oh my god! Oh my god, I just thought of something hilarious. What if she uses her ability on Brooke? I am so curious to see what would happen with that. Oh my god! Yeah, that might be a thing. Like, cause remember, like when Mister Two Bong Clay was on their crew, was on their ship, and then he was like, you know, like this is my money, money, no me, and he was like, you know, you know, like displaying the ability with all the straw hats, and the straw hats were like, this is great. What happens if they rescue Bonnie, and she explains to them who she is, and then she's like, you know, oh, I have the ability of the age, age fruit or whatever. I can manipulate people's ages, and so she turns Luffy back into a little kid, and Luffy's like, yeah. And then, you know, it's like, oh, that's fun, whatever. And then, uh, what if Brooke is like, what about me? And then she's like, you're a skeleton. He's like, yes, I'm 90 years old. I'm like, all right, I give it a shot. And would Brooke, like, <laughs> like, regrow flesh and be like, wow, I'm back, baby. <laughs> that would be funny as hell. It would probably just be a temporary thing because she's she's shown to use this ability on like the Marines at Sabaody, but I don't think it's a permanent thing. Because uh, if it was, it would be such an OP ability, you know, to just like, you know, because she didn't have to like interact with the Marines. She could just like, she was on top of a roof and like all the Marines turned into like little kids and like old men. And that was like it at like the snap of her fingers. Okay. So that would be a pretty OP ability if she could just do that and they're stuck like that forever. With her, I think it's permanent. Like she can stay in whatever form she wants as long as she wants. 
but with other people it's like a time limit or something. So that would be actually really funny if she could turn Brooke back into a flesh and blood human, but only lasts like, you know, five, ten minutes or whatever, and he like turns back into a skeleton like, okay, that was weird. <laughs> you know, like that would be interesting. That would be really interesting there. Okay. But anyway, yeah. Um, Bonnie, there's just so much stuff. She Every time we see her, she's always like, I'll never forgive them or I'll never forgive him. So there's a lot to go on with Bonnie's character. We're gonna find out about that next week. There's no break. Um, you know, uh, her and Arouge were the two supernovas that we really know nothing about, so I'm glad that we're addressing that here. Her bounty is 320 million. I think her original bounty was like relatively low. I think it was like 130 something. So it's 320 now. It's it's definitely gone up. Uh, but yeah, yeah, this will probably be the Straw Hat's connection to what's going on at Marie Joie with Sabo and Vivi and Cobra, and she'll explain it to the Straw Hats. How is she gonna respond to the Straw Hats? Is she gonna be like, I hate the Straw Straw hats or I'm indifferent towards them or I'll tell them everything I don't know we'll see how that goes anyway that's the review thanks for watching everybody crazy stuff this week and uh, maybe next chapter is when we're gonna you know start off the new arc because we're arriving at whatever island they're going to approach maybe at the end of next chapter uh, that was the in-between arc chapters which are always insane but there's only usually two or three of them so that's that's about that uh, we had the chapter with the Straw Hats bounties, and then we had last chapter with Amazon Lily, and now we have this chapter with uh, Sabo. So now I think uh, probably next chapter we're probably going to move on to the Straw Hats new adventure. So I look forward to that. Thanks for watching, everybody. Teching signing out. <sighs>Hey everybody, uh, I know I mentioned I was going to talk about the Lelucia Kingdom, how there was a problem with it being in the New World, and I just forgot to cover it during the review, so I'll just uh, throw it here at the end if you're curious. It's not that big of a deal, but it's like geography, so that's the whole thing, you know, geography is everything. So, the Lelucia Kingdom was first shown during Ace's cover story. Uh, Ace's great Blackbeard search, he arrives on the island, he meets Moda, and we know it's the same island. Oda confirmed it was the same island. Moda is the same character that Ace met two years prior. Um, there's a whole cover story there where they have to go to G2, and Ace sneaks in and gives them milk for their coffee. It's like a whole thing, okay? Um, but now in this chapter, it was revealed that Lelucia was in the New World, and that doesn't really make any sense, because that would mean Ace was, like, you know, in Alabasta with the Straw Hats, then he left Alabasta, went all the way to the New World for a lead on Blackbeard, and then came all the way back into Paradise, and then he fought Blackbeard at Bonaro Island. It was mentioned that Bonaro was, like, very close to Water 7, so that was definitely within, um, you know, uh, Paradise. It was also mentioned that Lelucia was relatively close to G2 and the Kamabaka Queendom, which are also locations that are in the uh, Paradise side of the Grand Line. So, I don't know, I feel like Oda could easily retcon this by just changing it from, you know, Lelucia in the New World to in the the uh, Paradise side of the Grand Line, you know? Uh, I think it might just be an error on his part, not a big deal, but I just wanted to bring it up because it did bother me. All right, there you go.